Welcome back, everyone. I'm Elsie Sunderland, a professor at Harvard University and a member of the planning committee. In this session, we will discuss cross-cutting issues in PFAS risk assessment. The session will examine the challenges and strategies in considering mixtures and developing class-based approaches for risk assessment. For these topics, we will have a short overview presentation intended to describe the current state of the science, what is likely to be known in the near future based on ongoing research and remaining research data gaps, followed by discussion with other federal agency experts and planning committee members. We will also discuss research needs to address emerging issues, including approaches and tools to rapidly respond to newly identified and next generation PFAS, such as new strategies for chemical screening and new in vitro and computational toxicology approaches. The first discussion will address issues associated with PFAS mixtures with an overview presentation provided by Moise Mumtaz, science advisor in the office of the associate director of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Please take it away, Moise. Good afternoon. I want to thank the National Academy of Science for the opportunity to talk today. Um, PFAS exposures are unintended, complex, simultaneous or sequential, multi-route. So assessment of something like that, you would expect is very important, but also very complex. Um, the community across the United States are concerned about potential adverse effects of PFAS exposures. Um, we evaluate the toxicity of such exposures to advise the community or the workers that no harm is expected of such exposures. However, sometimes it is to bring awareness in the community of potential effects if established limits are exceeded. And that comes around at public meetings, uh, health education programs for physicians, health workers, and through fact sheets. And so for this purpose, federal agencies develop methods, guidelines, framework, criteria, standards, or limits to protect human and environmental health. So single chemical assessment may underestimate the total risk. And, uh, and, and for that reason, we need to have mixtures methods. And those are reliable and can be easily conducted. Um, one such example, and so the federal agencies develop all kinds of um, this criteria and ATSDR 2018 mixtures framework is such an example. Uh, and it provides uh, three different approaches, the whole mixture or similar mixture or component based uh, approach, which is called the hazard index approach. But you all have heard yesterday and today that how the database is not as robust as one would like to for the uh, mixtures risk assessment. Um, but the HI approach, the hazard index approach uses the MRLs, RFDs uh, to derive value based on some toxicity of components. There's a lot of uncertainty involved. And to resolve that uncertainty, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that uh, you know, yesterday, Rusty, Thomas, Mike DeVito, uh, Michelle, um, several other people presented uh, that all kinds of research are being conducted that will yield results. And so um, these studies are both in vitro and in vivo. And you heard this morning that the idea of limited in vivo studies to establish the concentrations, to establish the dose, to establish what is the toxic moiety, um, we, we conduct limited in vivo studies, but the field of toxicology is moving more towards 
um, in vitro and in silico work. And so a um, lot of data will be coming out to fill some of these data gaps, particularly the understanding of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of these compounds. So it is practically impossible to experimentally test all the possible combination of PFASs and mixtures containing PFASs. So we have to look at uh, computational in silico tools as, as uh, Rusty um, talked yesterday. And uh, if you go to the next slide, then we see um, there's a lot of information that is needed in terms of uh, composition of the PFAS mixtures, uh, of the co-occurring chemicals. Um, we need some kind of database uh, to establish a registry to see what kind of exposures are occurring in the environment so that we can look at uh, in silico methods, how we can develop them. And this morning through um, studies which have been presented, you saw that we need uh, biomarkers of um, toxicity, of exposure, uh, of, of health effects. We need to understand the mechanisms of uh, action at the cellular level, at the organ level, at the system level to understand uh, how to evaluate the combined toxicity of chemicals we are exposed to. And of course, uh, we'll also discuss a little bit about um, variations in the populations, whether they're adult, whether they're children, they're susceptible populations. And all that plays a role in, in the risk assessment and the toxicity assessment of mixtures. So um, all you have heard in the last couple of days all adds up here and um, mixtures risk assessment is where um, everything is integrated and we'll talk more about it. Thank you so much for your attention. Great, thank you so much. So now we will bring in our additional federal agency discussants and Herman Gibbs, Scott Bartell, and Tom Webster from the panel committee for follow-up discussion and questions. And maybe I will hand it over to Herman to ask the first question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Elsie. Appreciate that. Um, so how well do we understand PFAS mixtures uh, associated with different exposure sources. Uh, the, the, that's, I feel like, I'm sorry, Moise, go ahead. Moise, go ahead, we've been together for 30 years and we're, we're graying at the, uh, as the time goes by. Go ahead, Moise. Jim, Jim, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, it sounds like a question directed to the Department of Defense. And I say that because uh, we're probably the, the largest user of AFFF. Uh, which has historically contained PFAS compounds. And so we're, as, as a, a group, we're very interested in, in finding a substitute for AFFF that does not contain PFAS compounds. Uh, and we're, we're keenly aware of the problems that our historical use of AFFF has caused. And so we're keenly interested in the research being done at EPA and NTP uh, regarding some of the newer replacement AFFF mixtures coming out. Uh, you know, Moise gave you three different methods for going after these mixtures, and unfortunately, we just don't have uh, the, the basis for looking at two of those. We have to test the entire mixture in an in vitro or an in vivo test system to get at where the toxicity is. Uh, we'd certainly like to be able to do differently, but you know, we're trying to come up with a substitute AFFF formulation now, uh, not three, four, five, ten years from now. Go ahead, Moise. So, um, Herman, I think it's a very interesting question. And uh, we have heard that exposure to PFAS is are from multiple sources, uh, from drink, drinking water, diet, dust and other pathways. So 
when we are evaluating mixtures, it is important that we consider how much of it is coming through a particular source. And it goes back to the exposure assessment and how uh, it is done. And basically, the better characterization of exposure, the better problem definition for mixtures assessment and toxicity assessment. And as Jim pointed out, that is really critical. And uh, if you look at uh, drinking water, um, every state gives a different, uh, what is called the relative contribution to a source. And uh, when EPA um, and ATSDR does uh, defined limits, it is considering the whole integrated exposure for that chemical or chemicals. So um, we have to keep that in mind. Um, the multiple sources are all affected by our lifestyle. Um, fish advisories are developed um, for uh, a purpose and the levels are defined as how much in a fillet. For example, in certain cultures, they use the skin. And there's a lot of persistent organic pollutants, including PFAS in there. So when we go and try to explain them, um, they have to change their habits of cooking and eating and all that. So um, it's, a, it's, it's something we have to keep in mind. It's a very complex issue. Yeah, and so, so when we think about, say, AFFF as one source and these complex other sources that we have that you've just mentioned, Moise, so things like seafood and drinking water, I think the question is really, can we look at the abundance of both the legacy PFAS and the new PFAS in those exposure vectors and use that in some of the in vitro testing to better understand mixtures? And to what extent is the, is the federal government thinking about ex linking exposure assessment and effects in this way? So for example, from, from some of our research, we can see that uh, seafood is associated with a very specific signature of long chain PFAS because those are the more bioaccumulative compounds. So you see them both as a signature in the exposure source and you can also see that signature of seafood consumption in people. So, so when, when you try to, this is a cross cutting session. So when we try to bring it all the way to health effects and we're thinking about mixtures, can we, can we use that exposure information to better understand outcomes associated or characteristic of specific exposure sources or, or what research would we need to do to, to be able to do that? that? That's the question really. And it's really gonna depend on exposure. So if you're, if you're living next to a, a Navy base that has contaminated groundwater, clearly that's your primary exposure and it dwarfs everything else. Uh, and so we have a, a we feel the need to get in there, remediate that as quickly as possible. But on the other hand, if, if you're a normal American and you're being exposed to PFAS from all different directions, but not necessarily a release site, uh, those issues relating to where you get your PFAS from in your diet become critically important because they can be a significant part of your exposure. And it, I've seen a, a couple of papers here in the last uh, six months where People are trying to tease apart that issue, at least for uh, normal Americans, where they're looking at uh, the contribution of PFAS, uh, total PFAS to the exposure. And they've not begun to look at individual PFAS that might come from a particular source as being uh, critical uh, either for health outcomes or for uh, its contribution to the total PFAS exposure. So great questions, huge unknown as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well, something for us to all think about. I'm gonna hand the next question to Scott, if you would. Okay, um, so for uh, other chemical classes such as dioxins, the use of a toxic equivalency factor has proven useful for risk assessment. Um, and uh, if you 
you may have noticed that some health advisories and uh, actually a handful of research uh, papers and studies as well have already started using a sum of PFAS concentrations without trying to wait according to relative toxicity. Uh, at the same time, we have one or two interesting papers such as one by Melissa Gomez uh, came out a couple of years ago uh, trying to rank relative potency of different PFAS and PFAS replacements by liver toxicity and pharmacokinetic characteristics. And so, you know, these kind of seem to be moving in the direction of, of maybe more of like a TEF, TEQ approach. And so I'm curious what the, the federal panelists think about, about that and, and what barriers there might be towards implementing that kind of approach for PFAS chemicals. I hate to be talking all the time. I feel like, I feel like Susan Fenton, uh, if I could address that. Uh, Dachshunds, a good example would be the combination of dachshunds and PCBs. So PCBs generally are looked at as dachshund-like or non-dachshund-like. And so you get into trouble when you separate out PCBs in that fashion because you separate out some of the PCBs that are actually uh, causing immunologic effects, causing reproductive effects, causing ecological effects. They do not have dachshund-like qualities. And so if you, if you have a group of compounds that all act on a particular receptor, and for dachshund, it's the AH receptor, is presumably the, the key step in uh, having dachshund toxicity, although I would argue that's not the case, uh, then you're good. But I think for PFAS, with the thousands of compounds we have potentially in front of us, we have yet to define a mechanism of action that is that simplistic. It may be that PFAS have two different actions. One's receptor-based, and, and I would say multiple receptor-based, and the other might be uh, membrane, uh, fluidity-based. In other words, the, they act like fatty acids and uh, become part of the membrane. So I, I think that's gonna be a very complicated and tough topic to, uh, to get our hands around, and I don't think we have enough information to say that the various PFAS compounds have a similar mechanism of action. Uh, we certainly know that's not the case for PFO and PFOS. So even though they are both developmental toxicants, they do not have the same effect in the same species. Uh, I would agree with Jim that um, it seems like there's plenty of evidence in the literature that there are at least multiple nuclear receptors that are activated across various PFAS, whether carboxylates or sulfonates, since they're the two most studied subclasses. Uh, but kind of a difference with, you know, the historically TEQ or TEF, like Jim was saying, generally applies to aryl hydrocarbon receptor activation by dioxins and dioxin-like compounds producing a common endpoint. And, and I don't know if that's going to be possible with PFAS giving given what's already known about multiple molecular initiating events and how those can be differentially effective across different life stages, whether it's gestational exposures or adult or juvenile. And so trying to apply that type of approach uh, really depends on kind of the back end or the apical effect or the adverse effect and being able to scale the different compounds based on the relative potencies, which is, you know, it's another similar approach to TEQ or TF, but, but it's not implicit that they're all working via the same molecular mechanism or even necessarily all the same key events. Um, and like you said, with PFOS and PFOA, you do see developmental effects, but the key events that get you to that point are quite different. Would anyone else like to? I can, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, this is Hannah. I'm sorry, I have problems with the internet, so I'm just on the phone. Uh, I just wanted to add, you know, th there are two interesting studies about um, relative potency factors. Uh, one of us uh, from the Netherlands, and uh, the other one is uh, Shinikario from ATSDR. And um, the one from the Netherlands I was studying like 16 PFAS, but uh, like uh, you mentioned before, it's very limited. It's limited to red, male, oral, 
intermediate exposure. And uh, they, they used P4 as an index chemical, and they looked at uh, benchmark doses and how um, these benchmark doses are uh, related uh, with relative potency to P4. But um, when, uh, when they actually looked at uh, the hepatic effects, uh, it was liver weight, absolute, and relative, and hepatomegaly. Uh, they, they were thinking about PPAR uh, alpha, and that's really limited relevance to humans. Although they wanted to disregard this uh, comment uh, in the paper, I don't really know how relevant it is to human uh, risk assessment. The other paper uh, from Shinikariel looked at enhanced uh, and body burdens in children uh, aged 3 to 11 years, and uh, the endpoint was developmental. And uh, they, they were looking at height, weight, and BMI in those children, and uh, they used actually uh, the MRLs that we have. And they just looked at the four um, chemicals, P4, PFNA, P4, and PFHXS. And again, they used uh, P4 as an index chemical. And um, they uh, concluded that the height was actually associated with a higher mixtures uh, index uh, for for the boys, but the, the thing is that again, uh, this, this is very limited just uh, to four chemicals uh, and um, body burden of those, those chemicals. So uh, I think it's a good start, you know, but uh, we have a lot to learn about those chemicals because uh, uh, there are 5,000 or something like that uh, around and uh, it's not that easy to uh, actually go and uh, derive those EPS or um, RES. But uh, the thing is that we don't have a PS also for all the um, dioxins. We just use uh, PS for the dioxins that are most likely to be in human blood. And uh, that's maybe the thing to look at, you know, just look at what is the body burden in humans and uh, at least make a risk assessment for these chemicals. That's it. Um, okay. I want to add, Elsie, um, the, Scott, there was a really good question, um, but the real problem with PFAS is, is they are not like PHAs or PCBs, which are um, group of chemicals which have a nucleus a main nucleus, and then there are structures around that nucleus. So PHAs and PCPs have a specific structure, and then the substitution around them is different. So um, the diversity of critical structures in PFASs are going to dictate what kind of um, ADME they go through, and ultimately, when they get to the receptor, um, there are so many different receptors they act, even though PPAR alpha is the important one, but they can also act with CAR, they cannot with ER. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of receptors they can interact. Um, and the whole idea of the TEF and relative potency factor, both of them is based on the concept that the dose response curves are, are congruent, that is, um, the potency is different. They are dilution of one another, but their dose response curves are similar so that you can then add them up as a potency weighted dose addition. So um, we need to have a lot of data to make sure that dose response is followed at various doses uh, so that we can do the TF calculations. And we might have to break them down into subgroups and say, uh, and maybe in the next session, we'll be talking about how to subgroup and all that. And that's where uh, maybe some TFs and relative potency factors can be calculated. It's also what is really important uh, in deriving these numbers is uh, 
mechanism of action. They always <laughs> say that uh, we need the same mechanism of action. And we don't know a, a lot uh, of uh, these mechanisms for many of the chemicals that are included in PFAS. Yep, I agree. Anna. Okay, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, Tom, do you want to ask a quick final question? You're on mute, I think. Tom, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, about um, methods for looking at health effects associated with mixtures uh, in epidemiology studies. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in the last session, but if anybody here would like to comment on that. Tom, that's a good question. Good seeing you, actually. Um, good to see you. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. Toxicologists like controlling things, controlled exposures, and epidemiologists like with natural experiments, which are happened. So there's an accident that happened. A population is being exposed to somewhere, and then we are trying to find out uh, I think yesterday, a couple of times, this came up and in our publications way back in 90s, we wrote that the, um, the experimental scientists and the modeler and the risk assessor should get together at the start so that they can all see what each other's needs are and how they can, uh, so they can see what each other's needs are and be able to do things. You know, uh, risk assessors are in the field out there. They need to solve a problem right now and they need to um, come up with a solution. So we might develop all these complex models and conceptually realize all this can be done, but there have to be data to support. And I think that's what we are talking in the last few days. That there are so many data gaps, uh, but it is great if epidemiologists and uh, Toxicologists and risk assessors can work together. And I think as we go on in the session, I would advocate that the more cooperation between federal agencies doing various things and the academic institutions various doing different things, I think that would be um, really fruitful. And um, so I look forward to that, but I, anyone else want to add something to it? Okay, well, I think we're ready to move on to our next uh, session at this time. Um, the next discussion will address class-based approaches to risk assessment with the overview presentation provided by Rusty Thomas, the director for the Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure in the US EPA Office of Research and Development. So thank you and uh, welcome again, Rusty. Thank you and uh, appreciate the opportunity to address this uh, uh, particular topic area. Um, the agencies engaged, this was not just an EPA effort, the agency engaged in sort of pulling us all together were uh, at the top, EPA, um, ATSDR, and the Department of Defense. And so both contributing to the um, summary of the state of the science as well as ongoing activities and uh, potential data gaps. And so um, I think the current state of the science within the class-based approach, uh, the group felt that uh, um, there is an evolving de definition of really what constitutes a PFAS. Um, there continues to be an evolving definition of, uh, of what a PFAS is, but that there's continued progress in capturing the scope and breadth of the PFAS landscape. We continue to know uh, more about uh, uh, what's uh, captured in that PFAS landscape and better defining uh, different uh, uh, parts of that landscape as well. <clears throat> I think there's emerging consensus on the need to use class-based approaches to inform decisions on PFAS uh, due to the number of PFAS in commerce and environment. Uh, I think that uh, in most cases, and we've heard over the last couple of days, right, nobody, I, I, I haven't heard anybody say, no, we need to take all these PFAS one at a time, right? I don't think anybody has really uh, argued for, for doing that necessarily. And so I think we are all pretty well uh, aligned with the, the need in order to have uh, some class-based uh, approach uh, to this issue. 
There have been multiple class-based approaches that have been proposed based on structural considerations, as well as uh, various intrinsic properties, such as persistence, mobility, bioaccumulation, exposure, and effects, right? Um, I think uh, many of those are under discussions and the, the pros and cons related to each of those uh, proposed class-based approaches have been, have been discussed already. I think uh, uh, part of what we'll do today is, is continuing that discussion as well. Many of these class-based approaches rely on subjective uh, definitions though of class membership, thereby limiting consistent and reproducible applications. So you may have uh, uh, one person that puts a PFAS in one approach under one circumstances, but puts it in a different class in a, in a different uh, uh, context or uh, by a different person that's evaluating that. So I think there's uh, uh, a need to uh, better define these definitions of class membership more rigorously. Uh, for human health endpoints within the EPA, PFAS analogs and or groups are typically defined based on a combination of chain length and functional group. We talked about that yesterday. And that the number of PFAS analogs and or groups and the associated divisions are really dependent on the availability of toxicity data or lack thereof. And so essentially what that says is what's driving that de definition uh, uh, and the number of those uh, classes is really the availability of data. Current research um, listed here. Improved understanding of the mechanistic and toxicokinetic properties and relative potencies of about 120 structurally diverse PFAS are going to be available um, in uh, relatively soon. Um, using these in vitro and, and high throughput uh, toxico, uh, toxicokinetic as well as toxicity type assays. Uh, and we believe that this is going to help inform PFAS grouping as well as identify additional testing needs. And we discussed this yesterday. Um, also, ongoing research is how to better create uh, objective reprodu and reproducible structural groups of PFAS based on things like Marcuse structural rep representations um, and chemical fingerprints. Um, we also have going on an improved understanding of chemical identity, uh, including molecular structures, PFAS and mixtures, byproducts uh, resulting from manufacture, processing, use, disposal, and existing information concerning the environmental and health effects of PFAS. Um, this uh, is being captured under a proposed rule uh, that was uh, directed by the National Defense Authorization Act. So um, there's a proposed rule within the EPA um, that is going to help um, uh, capture this information and report this information uh, related to uh, uh, many of these PFAS that are currently being used. And um, there's an improved understanding of exposures to approximately 172 PFAS uh, added to the toxic release inventory in 2020. Uh, and this is to help also inform um, some class-based approaches as well. Lastly, potential data gaps. And I think there's uh, a lot of them. And even though there's only three bullets here, it's a pretty uh, large set of data gaps. Um, I think uh, it's fair to say that there is really insufficient toxicological as well as toxicokinetic data to group these PFAS uh, that are currently in commercial use and in the environment on a robust mechanistic beta basis, right? And I think we're, we're trying to address some of that, but that's still going to, even after uh, the previous slide, that's still going to remain. Um, there's limited intrinsic property exposure and effects data to inform selection among the various class-based approaches uh, that are being proposed. And uh, um, the mechanistic properties of volatile, semi-volatile, and non-DMSO soluble uh, uh, PFAS uh, is also a data gap. We're really evaluating a fairly narrow physical chemical space of, of, uh, of PFAS, and we're not addressing some of these other um, uh, types of PFAS that are volatile, for example, in some of our um, toxicological evaluations so far. So that's going to continue to be a data gap. And uh, I think I'll turn it back over to you. I'll see. Okay, great. Thank you, Rusty. That was uh, a great overview of some of the data gaps that we need to fill. So now we'll bring in our additional federal agency discussants and David Dorman and Tom Webster from the planning committee for follow up discussion and questions and Tom, maybe you can kick us off with a first question. Hey, um, thank you, Rusty. That was really good. Um, so, you know, as you know, class based approaches uh, have been talked about. Um, Based on various intrinsic properties, um, persistence, mobility, bioaccumulation, toxicity, some sub subset of those uh, 
Um, and I'm wondering, what, you, you, you touched on this a bit. What do you think is sort of the most important research needs in order to go down that route? Um, I'll hopefully let some of my other colleagues uh, chime in as well. I, I covered a few of them, as you said, in, in what I had uh, articulated as the uh, some of the data gaps and, and the ongoing approaches. I think uh, um, most of the priorities, I would argue, are at least uh, beginning to be addressed by these ongoing research activities and the data gaps that are provided. Um, you know, these include those robust ways to create objective reproducible structural groups of PFAS um, and also more empirical data that capture these intrinsic properties across a broader range of these molecules, right? I mean, we're really at a, a data poor and data starved state that uh, uh, to help inform these categories and groups, right? Um, and, and those are not necessarily to just create those structural groups, although that's still a challenge as well, but in order to be able to select from uh, among those different class-based approaches, we're going to need data to inform that as well. Because I imagine that there's not going to be uh, just one class-based approach for every problem. I think we've, we've discussed in the past in, in certain ways that uh, um, certain decision contexts may require a slightly different class-based approach, right? And so it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. And I think that the, the solution to that is, is developing these robust data sets across these different intrinsic properties and, and other um, um, exposure and hazard and, and uses in order to be able to more effectively um, tailor your class-based approaches to uh, your particular decision context. And then um, probably the last uh, data gap that wasn't necessarily listed in, in those data gaps, um, but it probably should have been, um, is the fact that uh, we're going to need a, a sufficient number of data rich analogs in, in many of those, if not all of those uh, um, categories or groups in order to inform those potential human health effects. And, and, and those we're currently lacking as well. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to weigh in, but I have a, a, just a small follow-up question. Um, Grace or Barry, did I miss anything? Nope. Mm -hmm. No, I think you covered everything that that came to my mind. So I was I was wondering. Um, so given given the tremendous data challenges that we face uh, right now for some of the toxicological properties and and uh, you know in data needs in terms of uh, some of the in vitro testing, I wonder what you would all say is the potential of these in silico methods. Um, so using chemical structure to try to fill in some of those other intrinsic properties. So things like persistence, because that seems to be the thing that, that we have most available right now um, and can mine. And, and, and when we're thinking about timeframes of data availability, that's the thing that, that is most at hand. Um, what, what's your perspective on that? And, and what, are, what are your plans to sort of expand in silico modeling for these uh, newer PFAS? Yeah, I think. Can I ask a clarification there um, in terms of the in silico tools? Because I'm, I'm not really clear whether you mean sort of um, existing silico tools that exist for, you know, prediction of things like bioaccumulation or biodegradation, or are you talking about the development of new new models that can address that, that need? Because one of the challenges I, I sort of see is you know, whilst there are a plethora of different models that can predict some of those endpoints, um, often they're lacking um, the underlying data. Um, PFAS-related substances is often lacking, so the extent to which we can make uh, meaningful and robust predictions is is a is a challenge. So I I, I kind of wanted to ask um, the question to to clarify what you know what what you were really intended there. I, I meant both, and so your perspectives that you're offering right now are, are valuable. So where are we in being able to use these in silico tools, um, given that that's something that we can use more immediately or develop more immediately? Um, so yeah. thank you. I think Grace hit upon, hit the nail on the head in that in many cases, our existing models um, aren't uh, optimal for predicting some of these key properties within the PFAS space, right? Um, we are, um, although not necessarily listed on, on some of these slides, have an effort uh, to uh, both uh, um, um, curate that type of information that is available um, in the literature 
um, and in other uh, more gray literature that exists. So can you call all the uh, physical chemical properties or environmental bioaccumulation type properties from uh, a broader set of, 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 of a public and then use that to better train or update our existing uh, models to make them more robust within this space. Um, and, and, and that's probably one of the efforts that uh, is going on that will hopefully improve our ability to um, do in silico predictions within this space. Uh, we'll see how successful that is, but that's an ongoing activity as well. Sounds great. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, Dave, did you want to ask another question? Yeah, it's a little bit of a follow-up. So Rusty, one of the challenges when class-based approaches have been looked at for other classes of compounds is sometimes the in vitro and computational approaches don't really predict terribly well the outcome data available either in epidemiology or toxicology studies. And mm -hmm. but you have a problem for both the legacy compounds as well as the emerging PFAS compounds. So well, how do you think you're going to try to address that since it sounds like most of the effort is really trying to come up with a mechanistically based binning approach? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that's certainly uh, been a challenge uh, um, um, with some existing class-based approaches is that, uh, you know, tying some of these mechanistic uh, related assays and information that you're getting to more of these higher order apical effects, right? And, and showing that alignment. Right, certainly. Um, I think the way we are trying to approach that in these, in these uh, class-based approach that, that we're taking is to use that mechanistic information within that uh, to help, um, I guess, uh, inform the existing structural groupings that we already have, right? Uh, um, um, I think we talked about a little bit yesterday that we have certain structural groupings that uh, based on chain length and, and the functional group, right? And can we in certain uh, groups that we have already where we have a, a, a data rich anchor chemical, right? Do we um, do all those uh, uh, molecules that are within that group, uh, do they all have consistent um, mechanistic data that uh, within that class? Are they all activating the same set of receptors and, and biological pathways? Um, or do they clearly separate uh, some of them within that particular group may activate the estrogen receptor and half of them may not? Right, and so maybe you need to break apart that structural group that you've used traditionally, and that may not necessarily be uh, evident in some of the in vivo toxicology information that we've collected. Right, and so trying to fold that uh, mechanistic information in with a in sort of a weight of evidence um, in order to know whether you have a, a class uh, that is mechanistically consistent as well as uh, structurally consistent based on. Uh, what we've used in it previously. So that's kind of the approach that we're taking with this. Will we be uh, uh, entirely aligned with all of our epidemiological data and toxicology data? Um, um, it would be nice, but I think all of us realize that's probably not going to happen 100% uh, of the time. Thanks. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that? Klaus question. I have Another question, if not, which is, uh, you know, as we take a step back and think about a class-based approach to chemicals management, um, and this has been done for a few other classes of, of toxicants like the flame retardants, um, you know, are, are there lessons learned in, in the pathway of research toward developing those classes that could be extended uh, to PFAS or, or were there steps along the research journey and filling some of these, these large gaps that you've outlined today that, that could be filled um, to move us in that direction? I'll let the other, my other colleagues take first crack if they would like. Barry, do you I, want to I'm, take a first I'm not sure about that one, Rusty, um, um, speaker. Um, you know, I've, I've I've kind of read about the the flame retardants um, classed approach um, per se. Um, I'm very familiar with the the literature in terms of sort of category based uh, approaches. But what what I see more um, of late is a kind of a sea change in terms of how we fold in um, some of this mechanistic data. And I I don't I don't think we're at a mature enough level in terms of you know how that how that can be best done. Um, in order to, um, you know, say, you know, that it, it's kind of novel and, and cutting edge in terms of how we're trying to do that. 
And I don't know if there are that many lessons that we can draw from what's been done in the past that 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 we can bring forward. There's certainly the, the current state of the art that that's been sort of discussed that we're applying here. But I think you know the use of this type of of data that we're using is is kind of cutting edge, is novel, and you know I think we're kind of learning as as we're doing. I think it was also, Lisa, discussed in a previous mixture-related talk about how, you know, the diversity, the both structurally, physical chemical property, and in, 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 in every way, shape, or form, the PFAS are, are um, much more complicated and a, and a, and a, and a bigger animal um, than some of those other uh, examples that you're talking about, uh, you know, the brominated flame retardants, right? And so I think Although we can take away a few of the lessons uh, that were used to to derive uh, um, some of those class-based approaches, they probably only go so far when they come to uh, uh, the, the issue related to PFAS. I think that the extrapolation there is a is going to be a challenge uh, because of some of those characteristics uh, related to PFAS that we've discussed here as well as previously. I think to build on that too, I think, um, you know, with some of those previous attempts, there's been a much more of a finite definition of what encompasses that landscape for, for some of those class-based approaches. Um, whereas, you know, we're still wrestling in, in a sense, and, and this was sort of articulated in Rusty's first slide in terms of, you know, have we reached that consensus or harmonization of what constitutes a PFAS? and how to define the boundary of, of what that landscape is. And, and that makes, again, um, it, it a challenging exercise in terms of trying to sort of tease apart uh, what, what should be the classes and subcategorizations within that space. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hand it to Tom Webster to ask the next question. Yeah, Rusty, I, I did appreciate your um, statement about their different contexts. And I think of at least two kinds of contexts. One is existing contamination, like we would find, say, in groundwater or something. And the second is um, sort of ongoing production and new products. Um, so I'd really like to talk a little bit about the latter. For example, uh, new PFASs and uh, things in food contact materials and stuff like that, where sometimes we not, may not even know what's really there or very much about the toxicity. What the heck do we do about that? From a from a so this sort of class point of view, and what sort of research do we need to do to be able to to think about those coherently? Yeah. Um, well. That's a good question. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, taking that, <clears throat> obviously there are a lot of data gaps uh, associated with uh, some of those novel PFAS and, and what they could use uh, and the new uses and how they can be applied, right? Um, certainly uh, that is uh, related to the, some of the exposure discussions that we've had previously here, right? And how to characterize that using some of the newer technologies like uh, NTA and and others, as well as identifying what the data gaps are so that we can have a better understanding and appreciation of the exposure related uh, aspects of those PFAS, right? Um, I think that that's all contained within it. But specifically, I think you're talking about different class-based approaches towards understanding and characterizing <clears throat> the PFAS that could be related to some of those new uses, if I understand you correctly, Yeah. right? And I think, you know, the um, taking that class-based approach and applying it to your question, I think that um, in that class-based approach, you have obviously different uh, um, physical chemical properties and structural characteristics that are amenable for application to um, uh, a specific uh, functional use, right? And so I think you can use uh, to some degree uh, some of those class-based uh, um, characteristics that sort of constrain its functional use, as well as some of the characteristics related to um, the exposure and um, other related aspects to um, sort of um, narrow down um, both your exposure-related properties as well as um, some of the potential um, transport and uh, um, other related aspects that uh, in order to characterize those exposure pathways and um, um, and better inform 
um, some of those partic particular properties and questions that we may have. But uh, um, I, I hope I answered your question from uh, more a class-based context, right? Yeah, these are these are difficult questions. So we're sorry to ask you such hard questions. I think we're no, just. No, it's just uh, also fitting in a, a yeah, class-based class approach based to too. its use. New use. Sorry. Yeah. No. I mean, I think the the idea behind a class-based approach is we have a tremendous number of new compounds in new materials like these food contact materials. So. And we're lacking a lot of the data that you outlined that we need. And certainly we, we're struggling with even the basic chemical physical data um, for those new compounds that would allow even in silico modeling or you know, some kind of chem QSAR model. Um, so we're just trying to get our heads around, you know, well, what can we do about those chemicals and what, what might be next steps? So if you guys wanna weigh in with any final thoughts on those new compounds, um, and how, you know, if or how um, research is needed to inform class-based approaches, that would be great. I don't know, uh, Barry, if you had anything you wanted to add to our discussion here. I just had one last point maybe I wanted to make to add, especially to the, the newer classes of compounds. Uh, the, the newer uh, manufacturing techniques are likely to have um, fewer, I guess you would say byproducts and the things like that, which you might've seen with then with the older, uh, the older electrofluorination techniques that might've had um, and might've produced uh, more uh, branched isomers and unintended byproducts of things like uh, PFOS and PFOA. So even, so the newer, the newer uh, classes of PFOA, uh, PFAS is might, and just uh, might just end up being a uh, more specific, I guess you could say, and while our, our more legacy uh, contaminants are probably more diverse in their structures. So that could be a consideration going forward in terms of uh, um, just uh, the, the variety of uh, uh, exposure that we're looking at if we're talking about newer materials versus say uh, groundwater. So I just wanted to add that in. Hey, it's an excellent point. Thank you very much. So thank you to all of you. I think we're going to move on and just uh, transition now into our last session on emerging issues. Um, we've decided to forego an overview presentation um, based on this topic and it focus entirely on discussion among our various federal agency discussants. Um, and we have uh, Gloria Post and Laurel Shader from our workshop planning committee um, who will also participate in this discussion. So welcome everyone for this discussion on emerging issues as we try to get our heads around all the complex information that we've heard about over the past couple of days. And I think uh, Gloria, you wanted to kick us off with the first question. Thank you, um, Elsie. So, um, as everyone knows, newly identified PFAS with very little or no chemical, physical, or toxicology data are continually being detected in drinking water as well as other media and creating um, concerns among communities and the need for um, addressing and evaluating the risks in a timely manner and providing public health protective advice. I think it's important for everyone to recognize that currently risk assessment and guidance values cannot be developed without at least a minimal in vivo data set and this will not change in the near future. So my question is, can NTP and EPA continue their highly valuable focused in vivo PFAS research as needed to continue to support the needs of states and others in addressing public health concerns, along with the development of their in vitro research program that will provide data and evaluation of a large number of PFAS. But um, I'll make a quick shot at this and, and, and Andy, please, uh, and after me. So, Laurie, I think um, uh, one thing that may not have been clear is with EPA is that uh, we don't just have an in vitro or, um, you know, high throughput characterization of these, uh, and try to mechanistic characterization of these, uh, of these, of these molecules, right? In parallel and ongoing in that, 
is to also have some targeted in vivo studies as part of that second tier, right? And so what we're trying to do with these studies is, is better group them and categorize them into, into uh, um, both mechanistic and toxicokinetic based uh, and structural based groupings of these molecules and then identify, okay, what groupings, mechanistic, toxicokinetic and structural groupings uh, do we have left that don't have a data rich analog uh, for which we can evaluate the potential um, hazards and, and potencies uh, uh, of those molecules within that particular group. And so the next phase of this is really to continue to, to fill the in vivo data gaps of those uh, um, refined structural groupings going forward. So that certainly that second step um, is being planned for and is being executed um, as we go forward. So I didn't want to give the impression that uh, the ongoing work on the, the mechanistic characterization is the only, uh, we're going to stop there. I think that next step is going to be key to enable uh, decisions uh, um, for uh, uh, people such as yourself. Thank you for, for the explanation. I have been following all of this. So I have heard about the tiered plan tiered approach, but it was probably your ex explanation was really useful for people who might not know, but I guess the heart of my question is, this is the research is currently under development, the in vitro studies and approaches are being developed in, in the near or longer future, all of that will be available and the tiered will continue. What I'm saying is that in the past, the focused in vivo, when we find something in drinking water and we need to develop a guide, like a guidance value that studies that NTP and EPA that focused in vivo studies, not necessarily chronic or 90 day short ones have been extremely valuable as the basis for providing risk assessments that we can developing them to address these concerns and the approach you're describing is more of a long-term thing. I would hope that when something's really needed, it wouldn't have to go, that isn't, that something could be done more quickly that could help states and others who need it. And that was probably the heart of my question. Yeah, maybe um, there's a follow-up question, which is what can we do fast in your perspective? And that can, that be, can be used all, all currently. Yeah, so, so what is available in the very near term as, as research projects from your respect, or products from your respective agencies that can help us with some of these uh, newer PFAS questions? Well, I'll, I'll build a little bit on what Rusty said. I mean, in the, in the near term, you know, the first thing I think we're gonna be producing, which I would hope is useful, is the, the results from the experiment that Rusty discussed, the high throughput testing of roughly 120 PFAS, um, a variety of different endpoints. Um, in addition to the grouping work, which was just discussed, you know, we will be using that information to prioritize um, some chemicals. We have some, some in vivo studies underway right now. For example, our, our researchers have collaborated with others on some studies of Gen X, HFPO, diamond acid, and others. Um, as you can imagine, that's that's much more complex and, and slower work. It just takes a lot more resources to do those chemical at a time. And we'll continue. I'm, I'm not going to claim that EPA is going to you know answer all the questions on all the chemicals, but our scientists in the in vivo work will continue to be part of the larger research community that does research, um, in part indicated, you know, prioritized by the chemicals that we find from the high throughput work. Thanks. Great. Laurel, did you want to ask the next question? Uh, sure. Thanks, Elsie. Um, so we've talked a lot over the last few days about non-targeted analysis as a way to learn about the growing number of PFAS, but these analyses can't provide quantitative information in the same way that we can with targeted analyses and an analytical standard to calibrate the instrument. Um, what factors limit the availability of analytical standards for new PFAS, um, including precursor compounds, and how can this be addressed? Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, and maybe some of my other colleagues can add on. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a challenge. I mean, when we discover these new chemicals, we often don't even know what they are, let alone know where to go um, for a reference. Uh, we do have some tools at our fingertips. You know, we. We have, um, have made some exploratory efforts at working with um, different chemical vendors who can synthesize chemicals according to a structure that we give them. And, and for things that we think might be important, um, we can go ahead and try to generate a standard. 
there also have been some, um, you know, some companies which have been willing to share um, laboratory grade standards with us once we find something, for example, in a, in a river and in water that we don't know what it is. Um, so there's, you know, there are ways that we can get to a standard and get to better quantitation. Um, I'm not enough of an expert analytical chemist to know whether there are some purely computational solutions to coming up with um, better quantitation. I suspect there are, and I know there's a lot of people working on that science and, and we'll probably make some progress there over time. But as we do identify things, which we have an indication we think are, are relatively common, uh, we can explore means of, if, of, if not purchasing a, a standard, of acquiring one, synthesizing one, de novo. Laura, you, you, I think you mentioned just one, one challenge. So from the biomonitoring perspective, having you know, analytical standards is crucial, and oftentimes having to get them synthesized to pay for them is not a trivial thing. But it takes a, a long period of time to add a new analytical method to a suite of methods for a new chemical that passes all the quality control you know, requirements and now stands up as something that we're gonna stand behind in something like in Haynes and the national data set going forward. So while we're, we're constantly looking to add new things and do all the steps, it's not a trivial thing to say, well, why don't you just add new chemicals? It takes time, it takes work on the analytical chemist. And if you want to have a, a reference method that you can stand behind and you can make available to you know, laboratories across the country, that's that's not a that's not a trivial thing. <clears throat> Those are great points, Pat. And I think we, you know, anyone who, who tries to do this kind of chemistry would agree with you. And so I guess that that brings us back to this discussion. We've heard a lot over the past couple of days about the potential for non-targeted analysis and high resolution mass spectrometry, identifying these new compounds um, and, and producing a lot of really interesting new information. And I guess I would like to hear more about the, the federal agency's plans to use that type of data how do we ensure that the, the type of data being produced in by non-targeted analysis is in fact, you know, truly reproducible? There's been some discussion in the literature on this. And then there's this issue of when we think in a cross-cutting way about risk assessment, I think we want to focus first on the ones in the environment that are uh, most abundant of those new compounds, if you would all agree. Um, and so how do we prioritize on these suspect screening lists, which right now, you know, we're getting a ton of data, which is wonderful, but on the other hand, we're getting a ton of data. So, so how do we prioritize that information and, and what are the plans from a research perspective to, to moving toward more quantitative uh, information? Okay, I'll, I'll start on that one again, and then some of my colleagues can add to it. So to answer your last part first, um, you know, the non-targeted uh, method development is very much a part of our research program at EPA. And we know that some of our colleagues in other agencies uh, do as well. You know, we use it for somewhat different purposes than what Pat just talked about. We're not necessarily aiming for a method that we could incorporate into a nationwide biomonitoring approach. Um, typically, these methods go through a life cycle. So they start first as kind of a research method. You try different things, you find out what works. You get something that's stable. Um, you start publishing on that. You, you collaborate with others. And then over time, if, if, there, if there is shown to be a benefit from that method, you can move towards trying to develop an SOP, standard operating procedure, um, to develop a standard method and then put it through a single lab validation and a multi-lab validation. Um, we've done that, for example, with our drinking water methods. Method 537 was updated. Method 533 came out recently. We're working with Department of Defense right now to, do, to validate a standard method for non-drinking water. Um, we've got method development well underway for air emissions. And I, I expect that the non-targeted methods will go through that same life cycle. So um, a year or two from now, we'll hopefully start working towards some kind of an SOP um, across the field, maybe of, of professionals. Um, that being said, you know, there are still some barriers to implementing that in a nationwide kind of a survey. There's, there's expensive equipment and training, um, which we hope and, and anticipate will become more accessible over time. So it, it is going to be an evolution. But I, I think the science of high resolution mass spectrometry, non-targeted analysis will advance really just like all the other mass spec work has over the last 10 or 20 years. Great. Benjamin? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I was just going to mention um, one of the keys to just non-target analysis in general. So NIST also, along with EPA, 
has a very large research program in non-targeted analysis. And one of the keys that we've uh, identified is really in order to start approaching a standard method or even a standard approach for non-targeted analysis, we first need, need to get everyone on the same playing field when it comes to reporting performance metrics and how do we describe our data. And so there is actually ongoing efforts. There's ongoing efforts, in other non-targeted omic style approaches, but it's, it's, it's right now we're, we're in the progress of developing these standards. Um, but there is an effort right now. Um, it's an international working group um, that uh, EPA members and, and, and I'm a part of as well um, that has been working on trying to develop uh, reference uh, ways to report your standard, your results and come up with ways to harmonize methods. And I think that that's going to be key to first being able to understand your performance of your method, but then getting to your question about how can we validate these methods and how can we better use our information is we need to understand the performance to understand what the uncertainty is about our identifications. Um, so there are previous papers, there's previous research about uh, reporting confidence, but I think we need to get further down the road to understanding that when I identify compound, this is how much confidence I have um, in that. And then, and then our hope is that once we get to there, we can kind of start going down the road with things like semi-quantitation. Is a very There's a very large push in the community to provide, even if we're not going to be able to provide solid quantitative numbers, provide some sort of okay number to give us a better idea of if there's a lot or a little in something like drinking water. Um, and that will help us be able to prioritize better is if we can get at least a general idea of what the kind of concentrations we're looking at. Is, is something that's part of the general non-targeted community, but also part of this PFAS non-targeted community. Yeah, and those are great points. Thank you for that. So if I can get my head around this correctly, then there, there's a lot of progress being made in, uh, in non-targeted analysis, and there's a lot of support among the federal agencies for developing those SOPs. Um, and there's some thought being given to uh, semi-quantitative interpretation of, of those results. So, so how about then on the methods that are also out in the academic literature right now, um, what, what, what's the federal agency thinking on those? Um, so there are various total fluorine methods. They were mentioned uh, yesterday and you guys discussed them a little. Um, I, I sensed and perhaps incorrectly a little less enthusiasm for those methods, but those methods, you know, like the top aspect assay, um, combustion ion chromatography, um, the, the piggy analysis um, from Graham Peasley's group, you know, there's a whole bunch of different methods emerging. Um, perhaps you guys could comment on uh, some of the challenges in developing a standardized protocol for those methods and if, you know, what, what the federal agency or how the federal agencies view those total fluorine or total organofluorine methods moving forward. Okay, I'll, I'll kick us off again, and then my other colleagues can join in. Yes, all the all the things you mentioned are, you know, on our radar screen. We're doing research on some of them. We're working on a TOF method, both for uh, for water as well as for um, for air emissions. Um, we've used the TOP method before. I mean, I, I kind of view these things all as tools in a toolbox, and there some of them are very relevant for certain kinds of applications. Some of them may be broader. Um, I like to think that we could reach a place with TOF, for example, where you could use it as a screening test. So if it, if it could be done in such a way that it was not terribly expensive, then, then localities could use that to screen samples first for presence or absence, kind of like a litmus test, and then do a deeper dive when they find tough. But all the things you mentioned, the PIGI, the CIC, these are things that either we're working on or we're funding in some cases, um, extramural uh, projects through our STAR grants to work on. You know, we, we want to move very much towards some kind of a toolbox. And that's not to say that every method has to be has to go through all the steps that you do to get to a standard validated method, for example, for a regulatory purpose. Some of these methods could be very useful um, if they're simply published and QA'd. Um, we're in the process of building a website right now for our methods, and we're going to be adding, for example, our publications and SOPs, you know, for some of the research grade methods, as we call them. So I, I think everything you mentioned and, and more as more equipment, more approaches become available. Um, will be useful, um, but they'll probably be useful in different ways. I don't know that we plan to take everything to the same kind of multi-lab validated level, nor do we need to. Anyone else want to add to that, Benjamin? No? No, I was, I was just going to say one of the bigger aspects that we look at, especially with NIST and talking about reference materials when it comes to these overall total organic fluorine or the top assay, is, is the need for standards, but also a mechanistic understanding of what's going on um, so that you can do things like close the mass balance. 
And so we don't necessarily explore that because based on a lot of our materials are, te are targeted materials for, for our SRMs. And so we don't necessarily explore this more holistic approach. It's on our radar, but we haven't, it hasn't been something we've explored right now. Okay, great. So Gloria, I wanted to hand it back to you to ask a different question. And you're on mute right now. So if you could just unmute yourself. Thanks. Thank you. How can we develop more comprehensive publicly available data on chemical production use and discharge, particularly for those PFAS that have limited physical chemical or toxicity data? What data are publicly available and what data are, are not available or not publicly available? And how do these data gaps affect our understanding of risk? Relevant to these questions, data that has been provided to EPA as confidential business information by industries that use or make the PFAS may not be available even to federal researchers. And this requires that the federal research resources be used to conduct a sort of detective work to figure out information that may already exist. Is it appropriate to find ways to decide which of this information might be appropriate to make publicly available and to do so if appropriate? All right, I'll start on that. Then some of my other colleagues can also chime in. Um, you know, a large part of your question deals really with sort of policy regulatory kinds of things, which are just outside the domain of the science that, right. that I do, that we do in the research part of EPA and which really are kind of the scope of this meeting. So we, we basically work within the law as it's written right now. And, and we're, we're content to do the detective work to apply our non-targeted methods to try to find out as much as we can about the chemicals that are in the environment. And then to the extent that we can flag those for the, the tox work that, that Rusty and others were talking about. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in on that issue? I think you answered it well, Andy, that, uh, that uh, we do have to live within the constraints of the law and what information is available. Okay, I want to thank everyone for participating in this emerging issues session. And I think what we're going to do now is uh, just move into a general discussion and questions on cross cutting issues in PFAS risk assessment. And we're going to bring back our planning committee participants for questions to join the last panel and ask the other federal agency representatives um, who wish to answer a question to raise their hand. Um, Thank, and, and we'll just open it up now to, uh, to questions um, from the planning committee. We're full of questions after two days of information. So if everyone wants to take a breath and clear their heads. And again, we wanna think about from a, from a um, cross-cutting issues in risk assessment, given all that we've, we've learned, um, you know, what, what are the big questions that remain um, in our head? And maybe Dave, you could kick us off with a, a first question. Yeah, so this kind of crosses both the epi and the human data as well as the animal data and kind of is clearly cross-cutting, which is comes down to dose response and the disconnect between high dose studies, say conducted in animals, and concentrations seen in environmental studies. So how do we bridge that? I mean, it, it's that issue is common to lots of problems in toxicology, but it seems to be magnified for PFAS because one thing I got struck with yesterday was the feeling of chemists trying to, what I'll almost say is like chasing zero, so to speak, like how low do we need to go in order to be able to be confident about human exposures? And then how do we merge that with the toxicology data and mechanistic data? I would, I would just make one comment on that. <laughs> um, at least it, with our experience with the animal studies, um, and this kind of relates to a point I brought up yesterday about the importance of quantifying internal um, exposures and particularly serum or tissue concentrations um, is that the higher animal doses uh, based on spe differences, species differences and clearance rates uh, 
can result in serum concentrations that are not wildly discordant with human exposures. Um, we, our group has a Gen X paper that's actually published online uh, today in Environment International um, on the developmental tox toxicity of, of Gen X in a lab rat model. And in that, we have one figure that shows how the maternal serum Gen X concentrations relate to uh, serum concentrations from fluorochemical workers. So that would be more of a potentially worst case scenario than the general public. But I think it kind of uh, reiterates the point of the importance of characterizing the internal dose as compared to the external dose, because sometimes that can seem um, out of step with what people may be uh, experiencing. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Do any other federal partners want to weigh in on that? Well, I, I would just add a little bit to what Justin said. You know, part of part of David's question was um, having to do with the ability to measure. I think very very minute quality, quantities, and that is true. And you know, often those are for different purposes. I mean, we want to measure things so that we can discover them and so we can find out what's in the environment. I don't. I would not say necessarily that everything that we find um, is at a level that's going to cause some kind of a of an adverse effect. Um, immediately, but I think if we can find those places that have much higher doses that people are being exposed to, um, that are at much higher risk, I think that's part of the value of the, the application of the methods. The fact that we can go down to a very low level is informative because it just helps us, I think, find out quicker where those higher exposures might be. And maybe that segues nicely into a question that was posted by Mark Johnson, which is, have the federal agencies come together in ranking those PFAS of highest importance? Um, and perhaps that could help in uh, prioritizing how some of the data gaps are filled. So I'm not aware that we've um, collectively sat down and tried to prioritize, you know, from one to a hundred, a list of the of the top PFAS. Um, we we are maintaining awareness of each other's work, and we're all, you know, most of the work takes place with a, with a similar set of of twenty or thirty PFAS that have been well established and that we know are are out there. Um, I think we're going to be adding dramatically to that list um, over time as we apply more of these non-targeted uh, methods. And we'll probably find that there isn't any single ranking of chemicals. It's gonna depend very much on where you are in the country and what it is you're interested in, whether you're interested in, in remediation and treatment and cleanup or whether you're interested in toxicology. Um, so I don't know that there's a single list, but I know that we have, you know, we have a mechanism in place through our, our cross-federal technical working group um, that enables us to, to share that information and to keep each other aware of what we're finding and what we personally or our agencies think of as important. I don't know if any of my TWG colleagues want to also uh, yeah, offer. So I would echo that. You know, so we know exactly what chemicals that are being tested in NTP and the EPA, what chemicals they measure. And we, we tailor in many ways our measurements to what's being measured out in the environment. So we want to target the chemicals that are most commonly occurring in environmental settings, particularly environmental settings where the uh, people expose. And then for our health, for our health studies, uh, we're banking biological samples. So in the future, if more chemicals come add, add to that concern list, we'll be able to go back and look at them going forward, going you know, retrospectively as well. So, so we're trying to be facile enough just to, to look at the ones that we know are out there now, know the ones that we have good measurement methods for. So I admit that in some ways, we're looking for the light under the lamppost, the car keys under the lamppost in that regard. But we're also worried about what we might know about in the future. We're trying to preserve the ability to investigate those things in the future, and, and we do look work carefully with the EPA and, and follow the, the methods they're developing, what they're measuring, uh, and, and tailor our work based on that. Okay, great. It's great to hear about the coordinated efforts. Uh, does anyone else want to weigh in on that before we move to the next question? And if not, maybe... I, I have one minor comment it's related to that in terms of our laboratory work, um, sometimes, you know, we'll see a um, biomonitoring study, for example, uh, the one NC State's doing here in North Carolina, that will report um, frequent and or high serum concentrations for some novel or emerging perfluorinated compounds. 
And from an analytical chemical perspective, they're able to do those detections and you and uh, using relatively small masses of, of a maybe a laboratory purified version of the compound as compared to then us trying to translate that into an animal study. And many of these are, are oftentimes we find not commercially available <coughs> in a purified standard form uh, for us to be able to purchase and run studies with. Um, so I, I would say that that's one limitation, at least that we have experienced, is access to some of the more novel and data poor compounds um, that are detected but not available in the amount needed to do some hypothesis driven experimental work. Have, have you ever, just a quick follow up, has that ever been discussed with some of your other uh, federal partners? Um, I was just thinking back to Andy's description of, of industry collaborating to provide that kind of information or their ability to synthesize standards quickly. So has that kind of collaboration ever taken place to, to push the research forward or is that something that could perhaps be built on? Uh, we have discussed that with chemists um, like Mark Streiner and James McCord here at EPA um, in terms of, you know, if, if we're interested in something, um, conferring with them if they know of a way to get more. And then oftentimes that can, that can sometimes lead to, oh, there's a university researcher who is an organic chemist that can synthesize it. Uh, but oftentimes you're still limited by the amount that uh, somebody can produce under non kind of industrial commercial pro processes. Okay. But, I, but yes. I, you're right, there could be some opportunity there potentially for a cross agency. Yeah. yeah, at least I have an answer as well to that. And one of the things that I highlighted in, in some of our presentations is we've assembled this uh, library of 430 PFAS um, that were commercially available um, and made that available across uh, all of our federal agency partners, right? That these are fairly structurally diverse, but uh, um, these are the ones that were uh, uh, commercially procurable at a, a, at a a reasonable uh, analytical purity. And so those are all uh, made available more broadly for hypothesis driven or experimental work, or even to, to uh, allow for the refinement or development of certain analytical methods. And so we use that in multiple different ways, um, that library in different ways uh, in order to facilitate that. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you all for those perspectives. I'm gonna pass it to Tom Webster to ask another question. Hey, um, you know, when I think about um, the mixtures and how um, if we want to go sort of a mechanistic route, we need to understand things like MIEs. And so that makes me think about uh, it might differ on the endpoint. And so we might want to focus on endpoints that we think are maybe the, the most sensitive at lowest doses or have the biggest public health impact. and. Um, so it's kind of a big picture question about that. Like um, of all the endpoints that we've looked at, um, which ones do you think are the most important to look at well, with respect to going in the future about mixtures and class approaches? Anybody has any thoughts about that? <clears throat> Tom, this is Moise Montaz. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I, I think it's a um, very important question. And as we have discussed earlier, that the PFAS is, for example, the toxicological profile, um, ATSDR um, drafted in 2018, has P4, P4, PFNA, and the hexane sulfonate. There are data for those four where we could do a detailed analysis and derive MRLs for them. Um, if you look at the receptor level, they interact with PPAR alpha. Um, they can react with CAR. They can react with ER alpha and LXR. So liver endocrine disruption, um, carcinogenesis, and uh, other effects. Um, so there is, this, there could be a crosstalk going on between all these receptors. 
and all the data we are generating um, and Rusty's uh, group is um, generating, all those have to be tied together. And when we do the AOP, it's not linear. There's different levels. So there's a whole network going on. And I think toxicology has to move more towards a systems approach rather than focusing on one endpoint. It is good to focus on an endpoint, but ultimately they're all interconnected. And, uh, you know, when we were doing our PhDs, uh, Tom, in 80s, we were looking at hepatotoxicity or river, renal toxicity and just focusing on that. But we know there are other effects that chemical is causing, but we were not interested. We just took the liver out and we made the microsomes and see what's the difference and look at the hepatocytes, what's the difference. We never cared about what's happening over there in the brain. So I think we have to take a, since you asked for an overview of you know, how we tie all these things together, um, you know, the whole systems biology and all, some kind of informatics and uh, learning machine, all these have to be tied together to develop a model that uh, people can use. Uh, but again, when we develop such a model, which is um, we can uh, conceptualize and even practically tie the equations together to run a model like a PPK, ultimately we'll have to develop a guidance so that we can, a risk assessor can use that for practical purposes. Because ultimately in the field, people don't have all these computers and um, analysis power to do. So I think we'll ultimately have to bring it down to a simple usable tool. But I think systems approach is where we have to go and all these little assays which we are doing in the high throughput have to be tied together so that we can understand what is going on in the whole system. Well, I, I would agree. I mean, I think we need some simple approaches now. For example, <laughs> maybe the best we can do right now is just add stuff together. You know, I, I don't know, you know, and, but meanwhile, we need to be doing research on this systems biology level, absolutely. I agree. I think the HI approach is the only one which we can use. And I think all the agencies from um, EPA to everyone, New Jersey Department, uh, uh, all the health guidance values which we are developing, they're all about putting them together. But I've, you're absolutely right. We, we do need something which we can use today. And uh, those additivity and the hazard mix approach is the only ones which we can use right now. You know, I, I would like, I agree with Moise, but um, I think you were really talking about the toxicokinetics more than anything else, or excuse me, toxicodynamics. And when you think about some of the in silico models and why they don't really work too well for PFAS, I think because a big descriptor, a primary descriptor in a lot of these models is lipophilicity or log KOW. And log KOW doesn't really work well with these ones that act like surfactants, right? True. So I'm wondering about uh, support we could potentially gain from maybe quantum mechanical chemists to begin to look at other aspects of the molecule to kind of help relate that to the toxicity data that we have. So you know, things like dipole moment, hydrogen bond formation, things that we haven't traditionally used as descriptors. Maybe there's an opportunity here to look at some new descriptors and helping us improve how some of these in silico models may work on the kinetic side to help mesh with the dynamic model that Moise was talking about. I completely agree. These are very funky molecules and the, and the models don't work very well. Risk assessment is what, well, you know, you, we, can, we can give you an answer. The question is how accurate do you want that answer to be and how certain you want to be, how confident you want to be to apply that to communities or advise people or tell workers you are safe. I think it all depends on how, how acute the problem is and how quickly you want a solution. The more data we have, the more weight of evidence, the more confident we feel about it. Thank you for those great perspectives. I think we're gonna wrap up this session with just two final questions. And the first will be uh, from Gloria and the second from Laurel. And I think in the interest of time, we wanna keep both questions fairly brief um, and ask the, the federal participants to respond uh, with some brevity. <laughs> so, Gloria, please. Thanks. So my question is about 
firefighting foam, um, PFAS in firefighting foam because as discussed, this is the most prevalent source of elevated exposure in across the country. It's been discussed that AFFF contains a large number of PFAS and there's a lot of variation between batches and between old types and new types as far as the composition. One paper reported 40 previously unknown classes of PFAS in AFFF. So um, most of the information in the environmental data, the groundwater and drinking water data and the biomonitoring data related to that are use targeted methods for a very limited number of, relatively limited number of PFAS. I have two questions. One is, is research plan to address these data gaps to look at the whole suite of what's in drinking water and blood serum from AFFF exposure. And also I have a question about epidemiology studies at these sites, especially such as like the multi-site study where it's planned to combine the data from the seven sites to make a very large epidemiology study as I understand it. Could there be different exposures to unknown PFAS from firefighting foam at different sites that could affect the health endpoints and the associations? And is that a potential issue in combining the data from the seven studies. So there's like two questions. <laughs> we have two minutes remaining in our discussion. So oh, sorry. Um, if we can have a, a right. quick answer to that from the federal agencies and then maybe Laurel, we can, we'll, we'll see where we are with time. So please. Pat, do you want to respond to the second one about this, the studies well, and I'll wrap up? I don't think there's, a, there's a quick answer to that other than the, you know, the, the short answer would be say, yes, it's possible. And yes, we're worried about it. Uh, and you know we're we're defining exposure. I want to remind you multiple ways. And you know in any health study, you can define exposure using qualitative, semi-quantitative, quantitative methods, right? And so we will be able to look at some of the non less quantitative methods that might capture that information as well. So we'll be able to look at things like years that you drank the water as a risk. Okay. So there could be there could be a variety of ways. That we so might general do. exposure. <laughs> We're, 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 you know, we are concerned about it and, and we will explore it as best we can. And we will archive samples, as I said before, that should there be more information about some of these other compounds that might be in the firefighting foam. Well, I mean, you identified a big issue because in fact, it's not, homo, it's not homogeneous. It's, it could be very heterogeneous and it's heterogeneous you know, over, over time and space. So those, those are important issues. Thanks. Okay, well, this has been an excellent discussion and I wanna just take a moment to thank all of our speakers and discussion participants. Um, we'll now take a break until um, until 3.15, at which point we'll come back and uh, go through our workshop synthesis. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you shortly.